Hello, can you hear me? Hi, I think we have just a handful of people trickling in from lunch. You know, um, I hope we're still awake and we uh, had some Diet Coke. Um, great, we have a really cool session for you guys planned here today. This is the Mastering App Dynamics track, so if you're in the wrong track, um, you should run out. <laughs> um, I'd, uh, we have a, a great panel about ITSM processes. Um, we have some people who have decades of experience combined. Um, really, really exciting. I'd like to introduce the MC of the panel, Marcel Lichter from AppDynamics. Thank you. Thank you. Afternoon, everybody. Um, hope you can hear me now. Afternoon. Yes, so we're going to do this slightly different in a panel format. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to come on stage or ask for volunteers and all that sort of stuff. But when we were talking, Dave, I'll introduce him in a second, uh, about ITSM and how to make it entertaining, we thought being able to tell stories around experience is probably the best way to do that. So we're doing it in a panel format. We have three other guys with me on stage. We have Zaki from ServiceNow, Perez, Mansion House Consulting, and my partner in crime, Dave Webster. We'll start with a quick round of introductions to introduce ourselves, and then we'll get going, if that's all right, guys. I'll start with myself, easy one. My name is Marcel Lichter. Um, background operations, uh, been doing operations in many different organizations. Most recently, uh, I was a customer of AppDynamics, worked at um, RWE, better known in the UK as NPower, um, and have been working with AppDynamics for two, two and a half years as a customer and six months as a employee. Um, and I'm in the customer success team. So I'm a customer success manager for EMEA. Dave? Yep. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining in today. Appreciate you had a choice of rooms and chose this one. Um, so when I'm not enjoying a nice cup of tea, um, I'm a customer success manager here um, for AppDynamics. Um, prior to that, I consumed AppDynamics in the financial services sector for Capital One, um, mainly using it to um, complement already quite mature um, tech ops processes. Um, keep winding about the years, um, in integration hell was my bag with Clearcase, mm -hmm. and then ultimately I uh, started life as a developer when Java was new technology and, um, and mobile data was sort of new and exciting. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Zaki Bajwa. I uh, work for ServiceNow, leading a global solution architect team focused on our operations management solution set. So everyone knows ServiceNow as that service management, ticketing, CMDB company, but we also have a portfolio focused on cloud, automation, integration, uh, management. And uh, so I lead a global team of architects, about 40 or so, um, leveraging uh, those solutions to provide value for our customers. And like David, uh, about 10, 15 years in uh, financial banks within New York City, uh, working for most of the big banks out there. Hello, my name is Perez Chamea. I'm a service delivery manager for Mansion House Consulting. Um, most of my career was spent as a support analyst, support manager, and project manager for tier one banks. Um, I was always very passionate about monitoring tools and always became the monitoring guy in every role I performed. Um, in the last few years, I've been uh, delivering uh, tools adoption services to Mansion House's clients, um, and I'm also an AppDynamics instructor and really enjoy providing training services to AppDynamics clients on behalf of AppDynamics University. Awesome. So what are we talking about today? Um, a lot of our sessions, as you probably have noticed, are very technical. This session is mainly around people and process. So we'll be talking about service management, IT operations and DevOps, the reality of service management, and the reality of service management, and then the transforming of your IT, yeah, ITSM processes as well. So we'll bring that back, of course, to how AppDynamics can help with that. But let's start with service management, IT operations, and DevOps. So the traditional service management is very often seen as the why team and a little bit of when. With that, I actually mean it's why did this break down, why did this happen now, and when are you going to fix it, right? Zaki? Yep, yep. How do, you know, we let developers do what they do best and get out of their way in terms of day-to-day -day service management. The other part is DevOps, not the death of service management or ITIL. Um, consider, for example, um, the, the Agile and the Prince2 methodology. They're still around. Uh, DevOps is, of course, very interesting. 
but it still needs to be rolled back to service management, right? Perez, you have a good example around that. Well, what I noticed around um, large financial services is that there's great passion to introduce DevOps models. Um, however, what you usually see is DevOps team handing over their software to the ops teams for production services. Now, there's a bit of an oxymoron there, but this is necessary because of uh, regulations and segregation of duties. Um, and as I see it, the, these hybrid models um, can be implemented. However, you need to put a lot of attention to the feedback, the quality of the feedback from ops to dev, the right to left shift, uh, and obviously the capability of the operations team to accept frequent multiple releases into the production environment. Yeah, I mean, so for me, looking back, what, what 15 years ago now, um, when I was working for, for Siemens, um, there was a, a brand new project management methodology. Right? This, was, this was burn your Prince 2 manuals. Um, you know, Agile's here, it's here to stay. I mean, Prince 2 is still the de facto standard. Right? I wouldn't employ a project manager if they weren't, if they weren't a Prince, but they also want some Agile experience in there. So for me, like, um, you know, like Agile um, and, and, and Prince2, sort of DevOps and uh, your, your ITIL methodologies, they're going to have to play together somewhere. Because exactly my, my experience, um, Dev without the ops is, ops is just Dev, right? Um, and when you're in a, a break fix model and actually you can't fix, where do you go? You go to your traditional ops processes. Why? Because they work. Right? Just, it's just a sensible set of non, non prescriptive processes that you, you perform. Um, so I think, yeah, look, looking back 15 years, you know, Prince2 is still around, it's probably going to stay. The other very sort of up-to-date and very relevant uh, topic is, of course, the requirement of situational awareness. We no longer want root, case, root cause analysis to take four weeks or even longer than that to actually get to the point as to find out what was wrong and how we're going to fix this. So having speed to actually identify, log, and categorize all this data is absolutely important to be able to actually get to that key point, that root cause analysis, very, very quickly. Zaki, in ServiceNow, you must be seeing this very frequently. Yeah, no, we see this often, right? So the, the whole notion is, as folks like AppDynamics and, and others are providing that intelligence into my CICD pipeline, how do, I, how do I take that intelligence? We heard about the system of engagement this morning, but how do I take that intelligence in my CID, CD pipeline and go take action on that, right? From a developer, from an ops point of view, how do I say, okay, this you know, line of code that changed in my DevOps process, it's affecting the efficiency and effectiveness of my CI CD pipeline, and I wanna go take action on it now to go remediate that, and that's where ServiceNow naturally comes in to either help you automate the change records, the incident records underneath it, or to help you make that service aware and go take action on it, right? So it's really leveraging that intelligence from the likes of AppDynamics to go push that forward. Thank you. So the service management lifecycle, it looks great. For the people that don't really know the service management lifecycle, Dave, you know it very well. Yeah, and it does look great, and, and, and the, the, the image of it also looks good. So you, you start with, um, with strategy, um, you, you design um, good, good service in, that, that transitions nice and, um, nice and seamlessly. Um, you're then in an operation state and you have continual service improvement. Um, I think the reality is mu much different. There's one of them that you can't do um, without, without the others. In fact, if you didn't do it, you wouldn't have a business um, operation. If you don't fight your incidents, then Actually, you don't have an incident. To be honest, yeah, I think it looks a bit like yeah, this. Yeah, there, there you go. Yeah? It doesn't really happen all the time, right? <laughs> Simply because in real life, we get this. You start with all the things that Dave just mentioned, but when things go wrong in operations, what happens when it burns? It's firefighting. Forget about going back to the service design. All the other elements are forgotten, forgotten completely. Yeah. Even in DevOps, we see this very, very, very often. Service is very often a secondary or even further down the line than that. Yeah, you're, you're signing up to more firefighting in a DevOps world. <laughs> and I know that hardcore DevOps people say, well, that's not true. But from experience, we have seen that, definitely. I guess that many DevOps companies were born in the cloud, so they are the millennium. However, let's, let, let's face the reality. I'm guessing that most of you here are from organizations that has been a while for, uh, have been around for a while and probably couldn't really start as a unicorn. 
Absolutely right. So when it burns, Dave, you mentioned something to me the other day around service management being a very cold place. Yeah. Now, me, with my operational background, we used to like fires to you guys, simply just get you moving and actually start doing what you're supposed to be doing. Why are you saying that this is a very okay. cold place to be? Uh, is it, it, and this is kind of this is a, a personal story, right? So you, 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 you've got a picture of the scene here. So um, it's, it's an unassuming Saturday morning, three in the morning. Um, let's pick early January in the UK. So you've got post, post Christmas blues and your phone, phone rings. And it's kind of that horrible ring, so you definitely wake up. Um, so two, two things there. Um, you've got to pick it up um, and it's bad because you're the senior on duty manager on call. Okay? So your weekend is just melting away before your eyes. You've got to not wake up your wife, you've got to not wake up your kids. That's even more important. Now if you're clever, you've got your laptop ready booted and charged and you've got tonight's change schedule on there. Um, so you've got that in one hand, phone in the other, you get your slippers on and you get your dressing gown on because you're going downstairs where it's cold in your living room because you don't want to wake anyone up. Right? It's a really, really horrible place to be. And at that point in time, um, there's a million and one things that need to happen. So you've probably committed to getting some incident comes out within 20 minutes, a half an hour. Are you, are you five minutes in now? Um, you're going to have to be verbose and over communicate to your, your management you know, what, what the issue is. Um, you're going to have to um, wake people up. Do you take a scattergun, scattergun approach? Do you, do you wake up um, middleware, um, network support, et cetera, et cetera? Um, but all this is kind of moot because what have you been told on the end of the line? Now, so often I was sitting there in my living room and I was just thrown down a rabbit hole and it was the wrong rabbit hole because come on, the, the, the first port of call was, was rubbish. So we, we have an issue, I, I now phone you, Mr. On Call, duty manager, you know, catch, ambulance pass. And in hindsight, that cost, that cost me many weekends and it cost the company a day's worth of effort, whereas that call could have been so much warmer. It would have been great if it had been Hey, for the last 10 minutes, the, um, the number of logins on your, um, on, on your web application has um, is decreased by 50%. So all of a sudden, they've written my stakeholder comms for me. So there, it's going to sound like I know what I'm doing, um, which is always a good thing. Um, secondly, well, I can bounce off that and I can say, what, where were we seven days ago? Because patterns of business activity, you know, seven days, I can get a delta. So my incident comms are looking even better here. Um, I know who to wake up. This isn't a scattergun approach. I've maybe I've got some institutionalized knowledge of who supports that service. So I'm waking up app support and maybe I'm making up middleware or the DBAs because it's a DBA heavy service. Point I'm trying to get at, pre-app dynamics for me is a, a, a picture of me sitting in a cold, cold living room. Um, Post-app dynamics, these calls were good. I'd spent some time um, you know, in, the, in the sort of shift left world, moving the, the expertise and empowering the people right at the start of the chain to then give me the information I need to pass on to other people, make the good stakeholder comms, get the things moving. Um, and I, some, sometimes I, I had my Sunday and my, my, my kids were happy. They got to go to Otten Towns or wh whatever we'd, we'd planned. Um, my wife always woke up. That was, uh, app dynamics didn't solve that one. Um, and I'm, I'm too tight to heat my house all night on a, on, 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 on a sort of winter's day. Um, but yeah, it was my, my personal story, really. Um, spend time, um, the, whole, the whole stack of service management. Don't just concentrate on the sort of tail end of it. If you get the guys that sit there looking at the knock screens, the command center, the mission control, um, the people that protect your data centers, if you empower them, and they're hungry for, for this, right? they want to know their application topology, they want to be able to have a run book that makes sense. Um, if you do that, you're saving yourself days on potential horrible, horrible incidents. And, and Marcel, if I can add to that, right, the way we've approached this as ServiceNow is service management by itself, whether it's change, incident, problem, back to David's point, is, is okay. But the key is, how do I add additional context to those records that I'm creating? For example, within ServiceNow, what we're doing is we're taking and we're giving users business context into service management, meaning the cost of a service, right, the maturity of a service, the SLAs, OLAs of a service. That aligned with service management, change, incident, problem. And the third tier is operations management, right, which is where AppDynamics comes in, which is the intelligence at the application layer or the, or the infrastructure layer or the cloud layer. So now I've got my IT environment that I know pretty well. I've got my sort of people process environment within ServiceNow that I know well. And I've got my business environment 
which I know well. When you bring that context together and you empower a, a level one person with that data, right, that incident quickly goes and starts to get remediated and root cause analysis starts working on that. And, um, you know, that's really one of the reasons why you look at ServiceNow as sort of the fastest growing billion dollar plus software company out there growing 40% year over year. The unfortunate thing is, of course, that not everybody is a ServiceNow user or not everybody is a AppDynamics user. So you very often still end up with your typical incident management process, yeah? You guys have probably seen this if you've had talks with AppDynamics already. The typical war room, your app is down, must be the database. All good here, must be the network. Network going, what the? Come on, guys, it's not us. This is what we see very, very often. The sort of point your fingers, point you to the left and to the right. By, well, Dave, yeah, you mentioned this earlier. It's human nature, right? You want that monkey off your back. And we don't help ourselves in a way, you know, your, your, your RBMs and your Cognizance and, and your Wipros of this world um, that support your services. You sit in SLA in front of that relationship, right? Yep. Um, so they, th they don't want that. Um, so it, it, it's the next guy's fault. And you're working in silos. And I've had it before where you know, people just drop, drop from the line. You know, they're just, this, this isn't us. You, 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 you're wasting my time. Um, you know, even if they can add value to getting to the bottom of, of, of an incident. The best part for me always was that, let's say the database guy's like, no, it's not me. And you know what? I'll prove it to you. And then they'll spend 40 minutes proving that it's not him and that's something else. That's the sort of stuff that needs to end, right? We have all seen this. Perez? Yeah, I guess the digital nowadays, it's not only about um, your architecture, your infrastructure, your distributed technology. It, it's also about the collaboration, the quality of services. Yeah. This is very, very much part of it. And um, I, I remember many years ago, I joined uh, an investment bank as a support analyst. And um, it was probably the first or the second week of, of me being there. There was a major incident. It was a reoccurrence of an incident. Um, basically, one of the trading desks couldn't provide um, quote prices to their clients for their financial products. Uh, and I was part of the post-incident review. Uh, we were there in the room with a few dev leads, support guys, and some senior IT managers. Um, and halfway through discussing the sequence of events and the operational procedures, in stormed into the room uh, the head of the trading desk and said, who do I need to sack to make sure that this doesn't happen again? Um, Obviously, it wasn't very pleasant, uh, but it was a good introduction to the culture of, um, uh, of trading floor support at the time. And we're expecting nowadays for things to be different, very different. Absolutely. How we make a difference, as you probably know, with AppDynamics, you get that single pane of glass. It actually gives you the empowerment, shared truth, single source of truth. You can find out what the actual impact is and know, as Dave would say, wiggle room. There's no, eh, no, I don't think it's me, right? Dave? Yeah, I would feel like we're picking on the DBAs, but I'm going to have another <laughs> dig at them. It's always the DBAs. Yeah, well, um, they, 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 they had one with me. So I'd, on a, a number of occasions, they would just kind of walk away from, from an incident, um, showing them, them this view and saying, yeah, your database is up, but it's struggling. Yeah. But my SLA says the database needs to be up, so that's a tick in my box. No, you don't go, you don't go anywhere. Um, but yeah, so me as a... Um, uh, as a major incident manager, um, AppDynamics, yeah, gave me empowerment. I understood these blobs and these arrows uh, between them. Right? That was, uh, it, was, it was kind of a degree of enlightenment for me. Um, and it, it made everyone honest. And you're right, it gave no one any, any wiggle room. It was actually quite funny. And it was also a good way to onboard some of the technologies that were maybe reticent to um, adopt AppDynamics. So again, DBAs. Um, they, 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 they didn't want a piece of it. They had their own tools. Um, it was fair enough. Um, but I started to tell them that they were struggling, so they had to get on board pretty quickly and, uh, and, and get some dynamics logons. Hence the no wiggle room, right? No, no, no wiggle room for those guys. Saki? Yeah, I mean, uh, from my perspective, again, it's, it's that system of engagement that David talked about this morning, right, on stage, and uh, how does that give me the intelligence at the infrastructure application and service tier for then something like a service now to take and go take action on it, right? What we call the system of action, right? So it's really that, that gelling of system of engagement coming from the likes of flow maps and the data and the intelligence that's, that AppDynamics is capturing and then allowing an end user to go take action on that with something like a ServiceNow. 
Gotcha. So even with all this, of course, we still have the dreaded root cause analysis. Let's do some root cause analysis. Let's do we? some root cause analysis, guys. Come on. So, Paris, you, you, can have, you can have human error. Who wants to be server? Come on, server, over there. Wake up. Is Thank it you. DBA? <laughs> Going long. Heads, heads up, on the right side. Oops. One more. So that's just a few people involved in your traditional sort of root cause analysis, right? You get everybody involved. We don't know who to blame. We don't know what blame. We don't know where the issue is. And then you followed by, I used to yeah, I think we've identified the error. There you go. <laughs> it is very often, unfortunately, a human error, right? So you told me a great story about the human error the other day. Well, yeah, um, and this is kind of the, um, the, the yin to your yang, if you like, on your um, who, who yep. gets fired. Um, so I, it was quite early on um, when I started to work in tech ops. I was leading um, a post-incident review. Don't call it a post-mortem. It's like someone's starting from the, from the back. It's like someone's died. Um, post-incident review. Um, and it was, it was human error, which everyone knows is actually training, right? It's training, training requirements. Um, but everyone was in the room, packed to the rafters, people sitting on plant pots and leaning against windows and stuff, and very, some very senior folk were, were in the room, wanted to know what happened. It was kind of perfect, perfect storm. And it was a team, and it was a guy, and everyone, everyone knew. It was, it was pretty horrible. But before we even started, he put his hand up. This was me. It was my, it was my fault. This is, this is what happened. This is why, in the context of what I was doing, this is why, actually, I thought it was the right thing to do. I wasn't just sticking spanners in, um, in servers. He was trying to do the right thing. Um, this is what I've done about it to make sure it can never happen again. So like maybe one minute in, he just took the hit. And I he probably expected to get beaten up, but he didn't. <laughs> the most senior guy in the room stands up, slaps him on the back, and says, don't sweat it, and he walks out. So he got everything he needed. And for me, that was kind of a pivotal, sort of pivotal point because all of a sudden something weird happened. Other people started putting their hands up. Hey, I could have got better here. <laughs> people were in like, business partners. Oh, we didn't know this information would be useful to, to tech. Yeah, well, we can provide it. All of a sudden, guess what's happening? People are collaborating. Now, this, I thought collaboration was a word that, that you used to sound good, but it was happening in front of my eyes, right? Um, so after that happened, my my view of root cause completely changed. So I would recommend getting business partners in. If you, even if you feel like you're airing the dirty laundry, they will be open to understanding that actually it's difficult to keep some of this stuff running. You know, technically, you've got a complicated environment and you've got a set of very clever people that are trying their best, but do you know what? Sometimes they fail. And for me, that probably is worth more of a slap on the back. Don't do it next time than it is. Yep. And it's the collaboration part that if you're not an app dynamics user yet, you've got to like, yeah, right. That bit of software will actually enable that. Um, look, like I said, before I joined, I worked with the software for two and a half years. It does you to enable collaboration across the board. So you actually get the database guy talking to the network. You actually get talking, not shouting, just to make that clear, not screaming at each other, but literally talking, how can we fix this together? That does actually happen by implementing this properly. Yeah, and we see this as a major kind of use case for, you know, we've talked about machine learning and stuff, right? But back to your point, you know, Gartner says 80% of outages are caused by human error or process breakdown, yeah. meaning a, a manual glitch that somebody did. But if you think about the typical outage scenario where something goes, you know, dark at night, right? That leads from uh, uh, event to an alert to an incident to an outage, right? So these are various data sets that most organizations currently have in their service management and ops management back, you know, back-end databases. So the use case there is how do we, over time, apply analytics to these data sets to be able to do root cause better? Right? And we'll talk about that shortly here. We will indeed. So now that we've told you all of this, how can we actually make things better? How do we, what do we need to do to transform and start making improvements in all of this? One of the things as Dave mentioned earlier on, is education. Train them. Train people early. Get that adoption going throughout the organization. Service process owners need to be accountable for the adoption of AppDynamics within those areas. They need to understand how it works and what it actually does. Perez, you're a power trainer for AppDynamics. What do you see out there? Well, if I was asked to highlight a single driver for operational improvements, it, it will have to be knowledge. Um, I, I think it's a no-brainer. Um, knowledge empowers people. Knowledge encourages accountability. 
Um, it encourages collaboration because a lot of people like to show off their knowledge. Um, and, and App Dynamics has a fantastic set of training programs. And uh, one of my biggest job satisfaction is to see at the end of a power user course uh, the attendees just starting to make their plans of how they take this knowledge they gathered and are going to make a difference to the organizations. And that is a great thing to see. And um, on a personal note, if, if you have any um, education credits which are about to expire, please don't let them expire. It's really important. Encourage your users to go and do training. It's much more important from, uh, than many, many other things. Absolutely. Training is absolute key in all of this. We say that installing up dynamics is quite easy, and it is. Many of you have probably tried this, but to actually get the best use out of it across the teams and get that collaboration going, everybody needs to be trained. Not just the server operator that knows how to install the agent, but also the ITSM guy, the service guy, the people that actually run the SLAs and all these applications that you've installed AppDynamics on. You need to ensure that they get trained. You need to ensure that they understand what AppDynamics actually does. But talk about SLAs a little bit further down, because that's going to be a very interesting topic where that is going. Combat the ensuing inevitable two-tool problem. I love the two-tool problem. Or the many-tool problem. And so this, this, this will happen, right? Like, um, where Actually, you've got, a, you've got a team that views App Dynamics as a risk to them because they're able to, to hit their targets. Um, and, and why would I use tool A when I, can, when I can use tool B? There's no simple answer to this one. How I, how I started to combat it was go at, the, go at the people, go at the personas. There are some that are just right at the back on the, on the change curve. Um, get them on the front. Um, there was a degree of, um, sort of technical magpieism. I was literally just calling that, that phrase, where um, I, I want what he's got, um, but it was only through the value add that App Dynamics was providing this team that kind of led to this team maybe ditching some tools that, 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 that they were using um, previously um, and, and, and be hard. Um, so I gave um, some teams end date saying, oh, you know, th these licenses run out on date X. I was flavoursome with the X, um, but it really helped get, get people on board. But it's human nature, right, to, to resist change. I mean, App Dynamics was d deemed as a risk to some teams, um, didn't want to get on board. Um, et cetera, et cetera. There's no one answer um, to that, but be aware that it's coming and you will have some, some, sticky, some sticky users that maybe want to use their, their other tools. Shift left, empower each team. Yeah, I, can't, I guess I've kind of already, already um, spoke about this one. So for me, for me shift left had, um, had huge benefits right at the start of, of, of major incidents. You know, spend, spend some time. Um, explaining to your command center, to your, to your NOC, um, your key applications. If you spent time actually breaking that up into a finite set of business transactions, these aren't hard things to understand. Um, so we had this idea of you had to use um, verb noun for your business transactions, so log on, get this, search that, whatever it may be, really simple really simple to, to, to train out um, and easy to see sort of patterns going up and down and when it deviated from normal service. Um, but it's surprising the amount of people that don't, don't bother doing that. Um, they just let the people that look at these screens tell you that one a blob's gone red. Um, yeah, don't, don't do that. Train them, get, get them involved from the start. Get, I actually gave them the ability to create their own dashboard and they, they actually created some weird and wacky dashboards. Maybe they were a bit bored out when they were down there outside the data center and nothing was going wrong. Um, but yeah, shift left. Again, that's not just a, a corporate thing. Um, do it, you'll get, get big, big value from it. Yeah, and another perfect example of transforming your IT SM process uh, in terms of shifting left. You know, we have a company, a uh, client called Wayfair, a $2 billion online furniture retail company. And they're a heavy Slack user when it comes to DevOps and community and collaboration. What they've done is looked at their IT SM processes and they integrate Slack into ServiceNow to automate changes, incidents, problems directly out of Slack, right? So, so ITSM is almost not in their way, it's getting out of their way, but the releases, the builds that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, again, back to that shift left message, is just automated leveraging Slack in this example, right? But I can do the same with Atlassian or PagerDuty or any of the other products out there, right? But this is where we're seeing a lot of these innovative clients going is just leveraging the API to, to to push those processes forward. So how does AppDynamics help you 
to transform even further from a tool perspective, from our software perspective. The post incident review, once the fire is out, as you can see this morning in the keynote, we can help you with that. Output fireproof your service, which goes back into your continuous service improvement. Definitely needs to happen. Um, future services are inspected. Check before release, right? Implementing the different rules. So in AppDynamics, as you probably know, we have the dynamic and the static rules, but no rules means no data. You need to start thinking about your rules and how to implement them so that they make sense. One of the reasons why people potentially adopt AppDynamics is to get rid of a lot of the white noise. If you just copy the rules that you have from the old system into the new system, what are you doing with your white noise? You're just copying it across. Think about the rules that you're actually implementing to monitor your user journey, because that's absolute key for this. Keep everyone honest. That's another thing, right? No longer eh, database is not me, and I'll prove it to you. Even network can't say that anymore, as you can see this morning in the keynote, because we now even have a network component coming out very, very soon. So we're trying to keep those guys honest as well. Guys, anything? Uh, I'll, I'll go. Um, yeah. yeah, for me, Im implementing rules um, absolutely, absolutely key, and um, and, and give, give people the ability to to do that themselves. All too often, I've seen um, companies kind of ad adapt, ad adopt app dynamics and start to lock everything down. Don't do that. Let let users make their own mistakes. Then see actually we can lock it down here. We can we can lock it down there. Um, um, yeah, um, again, keeping keeping everyone honest, um, I think is it's kind of I important to remember that it is human nature to say this this isn't me, and it may not be you, right? Um, but something that I used to do is just like screenshot like key key bits of an incident and then play them back in the in the post incident review. Again, no no wiggle room. This did happen at the time, guys. So you know what 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 were you doing about it? Get on board. I think that. Uh, on the rule side and on the noise side, I've seen it so many times where um, a few weeks, months after a good quality implement implementation of a monitoring tool, of an application monitoring tool, you come again and you start a project for noise, noise reduction. Um, so it, it can be quite frustrating because it's, uh, it, it's very much limiting the, the scalability of operations, the quality of their reactions. Um, and this is something that, again, continuous service improvement needs to look into to make sure that this loop of improvement constantly happens. Um, I do think, however, that with machine learning, the future will look slightly different and the clean out um, or the weighting of, um, um, of events, alerts, will change and we'll get to a point where it's automated and even if someone made a mistake and created a silly threshold for something that keeps on alerting, I think that our future monitoring tools will just say, hold on, I know you. You're not serious. You're not um, dangerous to my business. I'll just weight you as a very, very low risk um, event. So knowing the things intimately, even when it comes to machine learning, you still, as a service owner, need to know your application, your customer journey end to end. Uh, you need to strategically actually create that understanding across the board, knowing what you're talking about, knowing what you're supporting, knowing what you're actually delivering to your end user. Um, talking about SLAs earlier, um, business transactions drive SLAs or the other way around. Um, it's, it's a topic that comes up very, very often. Uh, everybody knows that the standard sort of SLAs metrics around uptime. Yeah, you know, my server was up 99.99, absolutely fantastic. My hard drives are not filled up. Here are the statistics, no outages, absolutely. Yeah, okay, but can you build an SLA around business transaction? You what? Well, we have this customer journey, and I want you to build an SLA based on the business transaction. Has anyone here done that yet? Nobody. Anybody here use AppDynamics? Okay, good to know. So what stops us from actually using the business transaction to drive that as an SLA. Because we're too used to static information, 99.99% uptime. That needs to change. It's, of course, even funnier if you start engaging with strategic partners, where you want to rewrite your entire strategic contract. I no longer want you to tell me that I have 99% uptime. I want you to tell me what my business transaction looks like at key moments of the peak usage, and that's how you're going to be measured from now on.
right? We're not there yet, but this is going to happen, absolutely. The other important one I always find interesting is stop delivering to the business. Yeah, we're here to support the business. We are one business, yeah? IT more and more is integrated with the business. We are part of the business. We're delivering that success. Without us, where would they be? Now, they're actually coming to us, can you give me some of those metrics? Can you actually tell me what's in our shopping basket at this very moment? Yes, guys, we can do that. But your IT, what do you understand about that sort of stuff? Yeah, that's the secret sauce. We're not telling you that because you might fire us afterwards, right? Guys. I think the other, the other aspect to what you just said around business transactions, right, and having that business context is if I bring that at a much higher kind of service level, for example, you know, if I'm a financial organization and I'm dealing with my retail point of service, you know, my ATM service, that's a broader business service, but it has tons of business transactions underneath it, right? So customers need to know the business metrics around that broader business service, right? Meaning the cost, the maturity, CPI, right? The health of my service, things of that nature, right? So what we're seeing from customers more and more is how do you give me that broader service context at the true business level? Break that into transactions, break that into infrastructure components, application components, and tie that all the way back up to a true business service, right? And that's really the shift that we're seeing more, of, more and more of our customers adopting. Well, the, the thing is for me there, we're up against like, incumbent APMs, which have got the different view of you monitor your nuts and right. bolts, and then you work out if they deviate from normal service, what that means to your customers. Exactly. Uh, it kind of pains me in a way to see some, uh, some people adopting our product and uh, immediately hitting 200 business transactions. You don't have 200 business transactions. If you really thought about it on that application, maybe you could get six or eight that stress tests 95% of that application. They are business transactions. If you're hitting 200, you're, you're probably doing your nuts and bolts monitoring. Let App Dynamics do the heavy lifting. Monitor the monitor the stuff that that matters. Yep. Um, let us do the heavy lifting. I, I think that it's an easy journey because you start with visibility, which you pretty much get out of the box with minimal configuration, and then the questions will just kind of naturally trigger the next step towards and identifying the key business transactions and starting to monitor them. On only only last week, I was I was looking at. Uh, a release where a lot of business transactions were highlighted as anything between two and five seconds. Um, I started asking the questions and the reaction was, um, it's a third party where we send the transactions with a customer ID and they give back some credit information about this organization. Um, and I said, okay, and two to five seconds, is that, is that okay, is that fine? Because if it is, then no problem, we'll just configure it to make sure it doesn't show red or, or, or deviation. And people started scratching their heads saying, um, I don't know, it doesn't look great, but the vendor didn't commit to anything. So again, this visibility drives the right conversation and we're able to ask the right questions. Thank you. As you do, three key takeaway slide, right? Don't wanna just sit here telling a story. We actually have what we thought are the three sort of most important items, the topics for you guys to take away, and see how you can actually start using this within your organization, yeah. Enriching business visibility of your customer journey, come on, that's got to be on the top of your agenda for this one, right? Into using that, of course, with integrated ops and ITSM model, yeah. I still like the phrase that I think came up in Snow 15, if I remember it correctly, service ops, which I really, really think describes, yep. like DevOps describes, you know, development operations, service ops, that transition really describes where this is going to go to next. Haven't seen much traction around that yet, but I think that's definitely where this market is going, absolutely. Yep. So the whole notion behind service ops, and that's, that's what I lead for uh, our company globally with my uh, SCs out there is, you know, from an IT perspective, we're all engineers, we're all architects, right? We're managing my infrastructure, my app, database, network, tiers, and then I've got my service, my business context that we were talking about earlier. How do I take that service tier and my infrastructure application database tier and bring those two worlds together, right? From an ops management point of view to a service management point of view and add that user context, the business context, the cost context together. And that's really the notion of bringing those two worlds that, that you know, where we're all focused on. The other one we have on there is the greatest service health with intelligent monitoring and ITSM integration. Similar topic, right? 
Yeah, the, the key here that, that we're seeing from a lot of our customers is, you know, hey, I have, you know, 10, 15 monitoring tools, right? Yes, you know, APM gives me, uh, I'm sorry, AppDynamics gives me, you know, three or four layers of insight into my environment, but I may have a, a Splunk for logs, right? Or a solar winds for something else, right? So the fact that I've got five, 10 monitoring tools, how do I bring that data, correlate it, number one, but then number two, apply some sort of temporal analysis, time series based analysis on it, number two. And then number three, how do I apply more of the anomaly detection, historical data trending, i.e. machine learning to that data, and really start to reduce that noise Right, the signal from the noise, if you will. And more importantly, allow me to go take action on that. So that's what this one is to me is, you know, take all of your monitoring data, ingest it, apply analytics to it, apply intelligence to it, and then go and automate as much of that action as you can. Right, maintaining the service health that you care about. The last one, in summary, basically says you don't just do it once, you do it over and over and over and over again. There's always room for improvement. And we, Aptonomics, can actually help you deliver that, right? Anybody to add? This, I mean, from a DevOps point of view, every chief development officer that I've talked to, especially the Aptonomic customers, say, in my DevOps pipeline, where I'm, you know, designing, planning, building, releasing, testing, you know, and productionizing my applications across that pipeline, I've got 30 different DevOps tools, right? Git, GitLab, GitHub. Docker, right, Bamboo, Jenkins, you name it. Um, how do I, A, understand the efficiency of that pipeline process? So Apti, uh, Apti can help me there in terms of managing what my developers are doing. Mm -hmm. And once I know the efficiency, things like lines of code change, right, failure success rates, those kind of metrics that a chief development officer cares about. <coughs> the second thing is now how do I start to measure the effectiveness of that process, meaning, if I'm doing 300 code builds a day, well, how many did make it to production, right? How many failed going from QA to test to prod? So this is what, I'm, I, what I think about when I talk about efficiency, effectiveness, is helping chief development officers manage that pipeline and give them a business view that they care about, about behind these two metrics. Cool. Yeah, I think that um, the reason why the only few tools in the market that um, organizations now where they actually find really attractive um, is the fact, I, I would break it in, down into two, one of them is the friendliness of the solution across the pipeline. You don't get a lot of tools that developers like, testers like, operations people like, and the in integration of the tool across the pipeline makes the, the benefits huge, the capability that you know exactly what we're going to take, what you're going to get with regards to performance between one environment and another um, is very strong. And probably the second one is the whole concept which you talked earlier about of unified monitoring. The fact is saying, okay, you might have multiple tools, however, a single pane of glass for unif unified monitoring during these um, major incident reviews is something you need, every organization needs. Absolutely. Now let's move over to the fun part. At least I think this is the fun part, the Q&A stuff, right? So you guys have heard us talk now for a while. Um, we'd be very interested to get your feedback. Um, there is a um, way to actually do that, to provide us some feedback this way. Um, so if you have a moment, please feel free to do it. Questions for any one of us? Because if they're not, I'm just gonna pick somebody and make you ask a question. <laughs> Go ahead. Right up here. Um, you were talking about uh, companies. Sorry, you were, you were talking about companies that are uh, filling their business transactions. They, they have 200, and they go, oh, God, what, what are we going to do about this? Um, now, I, uh, I've implemented AppDynamics in two different companies. Same thing happened in both. It's been a bit of a victim of its own success. You go in, you implement it, everybody suddenly turns and goes, Oh wow! Can can I add something to that? Can I can I monitor something as well? Can you add this, that, and the other? All of a sudden, you have two hundred. How how do you deal with that? For for me, I can't really go go back a few slides, but um, dissect the application with the business to understand what matters. What what are the big things? Mm -hmm. um, I can always get that down to between kind of eight eight and ten. 
Um, there may be some other things that people are, are just kind of interested in. There are other it's ways to get at that, that data. They don't need to be business transactions. Also, I guess you could use the business transaction concept, but you're not capturing business transactions. There must be a, uh, you know, just some, something someone's interested in. Mm. Um, but in the, in the terms of a business transaction, 200 in a, simple in a single application? Yeah, more. Yeah, from, from my point of view, so it's more of a top-down, right, where you go to a business owner, and I, I'm a 3R guy, right? There's sort of risk, revenue, reliability. That's what you really care about at a business service level. So let's define the metrics that you care about behind these three, and then the transactions should align to those, right? Versus having 300 transactions they may throw at us. Well, how do they align to these three R's? And are those the ones we should be measuring and monitoring? Yeah, I think that if you have more than 200 business transactions, you're probably looking at more than one application. So you probably need, want, want to think about how do I break it down logically into multiple applications because you can view them across applications anyway. But I have seen a few um, areas where um, it wasn't, it was more than an application. It was actually a platform which was monitored, but the, but the clients insisted on seeing it as one application. And in these rare occasions, I would say, you know, go and change the config items to allow yourself more than 200 business transactions, but it might limit your scalability, the, the scalability of your controller, so. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Come on, I've got a lovely unicorn balloon to give away for the best question. Come on. I don't want to take this home. My son hates pink. If not, we're going to close. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you.